Hi, this is Pastor Phil McKinney, Senior Pastor of Believer's Christian Church. We're so excited to sow this message into your life. We pray that the Holy Spirit would minister to you, bring revelation to your heart, and make lasting change for the good. All right, this morning, the title of my message is Having Compassion for the Lost. And I want to qualify a few things as we get into this, because last week I, I made the, we handed out these cards, and the statement that I made was, uh, partner with us, let's believe God for those who are lost. And I want, to, I want to make sure that I express my heart clearly and that I do it in such a way that everyone understands what I mean by this. When we talk about the lost, oftentimes our imaginations, the way we think, goes towards baby killers, murderers. Those who have a past that's real, you know, devious. You know, the, the real, the most dirty image you can envision. But, you know, the lost could simply be someone that has something that's broken and they just don't know it. How many of you uh, have, have rented a, uh, a car in your travels before? Recently, or I did a lot of traveling over the last few years, and my cars are late model cars with a lot of miles and a lot of wear, and I'm probably not, as good as I should be on upkeep and things that on my cars, something that I, I need to do better on. But you know, when I go out and rent these cars, they're brand new. I mean, they're still under warranty. Everything on them's tight. We were in Oklahoma here a couple weeks ago and rented this car, and we pull up to the stop sign, and, and I go to hit the brakes like I would my big Buick, and I about sent Chad and I through the windshield. <laughs> like, man, these things really work. <laughs> and it... The analogy in that is oftentimes you don't, if you don't know something is broken, you don't even think to fix it. We have people in our lives that they don't know that they're broken. They don't know that something needs to be fixed. Now, they may be able to judge the symptoms of something in their life that they recognize, I'm unhappy about this, but they don't even know that there's a solution to what they're unhappy about. I also want to say that I came from a train of thought that it was us versus them. And that now that you're in, you're like the spoiled kid on the block. And all the other naughty kids are on the block. You know, we look down on them. We're, we're daddy's favorite. You know, we get everything just right. And, and uh, now we snub our nose at the kid down the road who doesn't have it as good as us. You know, the word sin actually means to miss the mark. I've said this before that in... in uh, in old times or ancient days, when they would do archery shoots, they would pull back and they would aim and release. And the person that would go down and inspect the arrow would yell, Sin, 15 degrees. What they meant was that they missed the mark. So sin is simply missing the mark of perfection. If we are going to, to have an attitude toward those that are not born again yet, as an inferior person or people groups or even worse if we're going to view them as people that aren't lovable or lovely until they become like us then we've missed the mark we've missed the mark I want us to to look through the eyes of love when we talk about the lost and this morning I already began to talk about there are those that um, if you don't know something's broken you don't know that it needs to be fixed but once you realize, or the realization comes that something is broken, most people think something to the effect of, how badly does it really affect me? Because after all, I've been dealing with it up until now. Or next thing maybe you might ask yourself is, how does this reflect on me? Uh, how is it that it's going to make people see me? Or this this thing that's broken now, I realize it's broken. The next thing for many of us might think is, what's it going to cost me to fix it or upgrade it to make it how it should be? Maybe for those of you do-it-yourselfers, can I fix it myself? Save a few dollars. But in most cases, people, if they knew how to fix something, they'd do it. Most of us don't, don't leave something undone if we know how to fix it. What frustrates many of us is that you know it needs to be fixed. You just don't know how to do it. Or even where to start. So spiritually speaking, the lost family and friends in our lives, in most cases, don't know that, that they're broken. Once the realization or revelation occurs to them that 
uh, some of the same questions can actually apply to what I just said. Uh, how badly is this affecting me? Because after all, I've been living this way my whole life. How does it reflect my image now on others? When I got born again as a teenager, uh, I remember the peer pressure of what that looked like to my peers. Am I now a weird religious kid? Is what I'm doing, if I'm not doing what the cool kids are doing or what's popular, even though it's self-destructive, does that now put me in a light that am I okay with being uh, viewed that way? And let, let's face it. Our young people that are here with us, they're facing that very real temptation, that very real challenge of being the odd one. Us adults deal with that. How much more are our teenagers and young, young people? What is this going to cost? What do I have to give up or what do I have to do now that I realize that I'm, I'm spiritually broken? And then, very popular, can I fix it myself? What if I just start behaving better? You know, the analogy, I was, I was thinking this morning on this, that if I were to hand over the keys to a five-year-old, would I be surprised if that five-year-old crashed my car through the house? And yet we're surprised when a sinner acts like a sinner. Can you believe what that guy is doing? Can you believe that that family is allowing that? Like we're surprised that a sinner is sinning. You know what I mean? They're doing what their nature is. It's like looking at my dog. I can't believe you're barking. <laughs> What's wrong with you? I'm talking to you. Talk to me. Seems silly. But if our expectation is going to be surprised that someone who doesn't know Jesus, doesn't have that life-giving power on the inside of them, how are they going to perform any different? It's their nature. But yet we, we do that if we're honest with ourselves because it at least elevates me. I'm doing something a little bit better than the guy down the road. Of course, we wouldn't put words to that because we're better than that. We're religious. Ouch or amen. But there's another, set of, there's another group of people that when we talk about those that are lost, there are those that are spiritually devastated. There are those that um, are hurt and broken and they're wandering around like one lost because of a spiritual event that happened to them. And see, events in life don't by themselves grow or erode our faith. It's our interpretation of that event that determines which way we go. The conclusion that we draw about God in the midst of a circumstance will drive us toward or away from Him. We all, Christian or lost, face potentially devastating circumstances. We can, we, you know, uh, for those of us uh, word and faith or charismatic ones, we want to be so careful not to speak it out, but because if we, if we acknowledge it or if we don't acknowledge it, maybe it's not there. But, you know, the difference in acknowledging it isn't saying uh, if you've received a diagnosis, it's not outside of faith to say I've received a diagnosis, you fill in the blank, whatever that might be. What's outside of faith is saying, now I identify with this. Okay? So if you're, if you're diagnosed with something, again, I don't mean to always go back to healing, but it seems like across the board we can use this as an applicable uh, example. If Cassie, God forbid, was diagnosed with a cancer, and she came to me and said, the doctors say there's a cancer in my body. That's not outside of faith until she begins to receive that as her own. Mm -hmm. Now, by faith, we can use our words our authority, use our, uh, the promises of God to make a, a fight to war against that. But there are circumstances in life, whether you're a believer or not, that by your interpretation will determine if your faith is increased or eroded. And none of us like it, period. No one likes to go through a struggle. No one, everybody wants to have piece of cake, easy days. And I'm one of them. I, I jokingly... If my grandmother ever hears any of these recordings, she is going to whoop me, I'm telling you. But she's a funny example. For years, I would, call, I would call my grandmother, because if I don't every two weeks, I've told you, it usually follows with, oh, babe, I didn't know if y'all were dead, or something crazy, okay? <laughs> dead? You know, I just missed it by a day, Grandma. But every time that we talked, her way of communicating 
was to repeat all the bad things that are going on in her life. And by some crazy chance that there was nothing bad going on in her life, I had to hear about the neighbors. And then I had to hear about the bad thing going on for one of their employees. It was just the way she communicated. So she'd ask me, well, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Oh, sure you are. <laughs> so finally I asked her. I said, Grandma, if I thought real hard, if I gave it some real consideration, I could come up with something probably that isn't going just right. But I, I got to give it some consideration. Well, she was asked me another, another time. She said, do you ever have a bad day? Mm. Probably. But I, I, I sure don't have very many of them because I think as your attitude is, so goes your life. And so, yes, events happen to me. People will make me mad or hurt my feelings or something cost me something I didn't want to pay. Yes, but my interpretation, how I respond to that is either going to increase or erode my relationship or my faith in what Jesus is doing in my life. A famous individual that most of you have heard of by the name of Ted Turner, one of the richest men in America, grew up wanting to be a missionary. While he was young, his sister contracted leukemia. And he tells a story. He and his family prayed and prayed. He was told that if he had enough faith that she would survive. When she didn't, he determined that if, uh, if there was a God, he certainly couldn't be trusted. He interpreted his sister's death as evidence that God's weakness, inattentiveness, or non-existence. And so he began to go on a, a, a lifelong pursuit of voicing his angst against this Christian God. Another very famous name, the late Steve Jobs, experienced a, a similar crisis of faith. On the cover of the July 12, 1968 edition of Life magazine was a disturbing picture of two children from the war-torn region of, of uh, I, I believe it's, it's pronounced Biafra. Biafra was a secessionist state uh, in Nigeria that maintained its independence for only two and a half years uh, before it was inaugurated back into Nigeria. More than one million people died, either from civil war or from famine during this time. At 13 years old, Steve Jobs found it in, impossible to reconcile the picture with the lessons that he had been being taught at his local Lutheran church. So Steve Jobs, in his biography, uh, we can read, that Steve took the magazine to his Sunday school and confronted the church's pastor. He said, if I raise my finger, will God know which one I'm going to raise before I do it? And the pastor answered, yes, God knows everything. So Jobs then pulled out the life cover and asked, well, does God know about this and what's going to happen to these children? And the answer he received was less than acceptable. According to the biography, Steve never went back to church. But it wasn't the picture on the cover that undermined Steve's faith. It was his interpretation of the picture that drove him away. Now, if you've ever been on a, a foreign missions trip, and I'm embarrassed that I haven't, uh, I need to fix that. I've never been on a missions trip, and I, I, and I need to. But every person that I've talked to about uh, any type of missions, especially in a third world area, most of them will come back with a report that the reason the people are suffering so severely isn't because there isn't sufficient food for them or sufficient money. It's they have a corrupt government that doesn't distribute that food or hoards it or controls the people by holding back the funds or the food. Missionaries go in, Christian organizations go in, and they're doing, and, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, they're doing everything they can to minister to these people. And I was told a story one time how prosperity here in America is very different than what uh, we would see around the world. Prosperity to you and I uh, would think more and more zeros at the end of our checkbook or having the larger house on the block or the, the longer car in the driveway. We represent here in America only 3% of the population of the world. And I think it's 90% of the wealth. So the missionary was taking through a small group in a, in a, outside of a village in one of, the, one of the African areas or territories, and they looked over the hill, and he asked the man, how do you possibly teach prosperity to a group of people like this that have nothing? 
And the missionary was puzzled by the question because he clearly had a different revelation of what prosperity was. Mm -hmm. And he looked across these, these two sections of huts. There was a hut group over here and a, another hut group over here. And this group over here was just mud put together and a few leaves over the top of it and pretty shabby, even by hut standards. So this section of huts, the walls were solid. There was steel on the roof. And they were, they were cleaned up and they were noticeably different. And the missionary said, the ones that are very poorly put together are the Muslims. And the ones that have the steel roofs and the nicer put together, they're the born-again Christians. They're living very prosperous. So again, it has to do with your interpretation or your perspective on what God's doing and the events or circumstances that come into our lives. How we respond will either erode or increase what we see Jesus doing in our lives. I remember as a youth pastor in Wisconsin, I got a call that nobody ever wants to hear that one of our youth, had, had his heart had stopped and they'd taken him to the ER. Uh, I found out later they tried for about 45 minutes in the apartment to get his heart back going. Uh, when I got to the emergency room with the mom and then not a few minutes behind that, our, our pastor came. The, uh, the lifeless boy was there and, and they were still trying to work on him and for about 20 days I think um, they took him to the children's hospital they did everything they could to um, bring him back all that time that he was without oxygen he, he became brain dead and you know we prayed that whole entire time that God was going to raise this boy 15 years old tragic mistake the doctor changes his, the boy's medication over the phone without having him come in he reacted to it and his heart stopped but we believed God. And I remember one day we were driving down because we had heard word that finally they were going to let him expire. He was t living completely on um, assisted help. There was nothing about him that was sustaining. If Without medical assistance, he wasn't going to live. And I was furious. I remember driving down to Milwaukee thinking, God, is this for real or not? Are we praying for the sick and they're getting well or not? How is it that I, I teach with such confidence? I can read it in the scriptures that people are raised from the dead and this 15-year-old boy is going to die? Are we missing it? What's wrong with either us or I'm teaching something that's a lie? I was so mad by this. I almost stopped everything I ever was doing with God in that moment. It was such a pivotal point in my life because I just could not understand how exactly what we thought we were doing, the prayer was not coming to pass. This boy was still dying and he died. We did his funeral. And I, I, for years, struggled to understand that. Made me, the emotion even talking about it, I can remember how I felt. Some years later, I found out that our pastor actually had a vision of, of this young boy whose name was Jason. And he had a vision that he was there being received by Jesus. And it was Jason's desire to stay. Had I ever heard that, my perspective at the time was that God failed me. He didn't come through. My confidence was being eroded by my perspective because I didn't know the whole picture. Having known that years later, it released me. And I realized, you know what? There's mystery to things that you don't know all the answers. You don't. We don't. I don't. As much confidence as I teach in or I want to teach in, I don't know all the answers. I don't know why someone doesn't always get healed. Though healing was purchased for us on the cross, I pray with absolute confidence every single time that that person is going to receive their healing and not every time do I see it. Deliverances and other things that we see, I don't have all the answers. You don't have all the answers. I can tell you that there are things that we may find out later that we didn't know, that we simply didn't know. I've heard stories of people that were on their deathbed they, they, for the sake of their family, were saying the right thing. But in their hearts, they did not want to stay. They'd already given up. Not even a bad way. It was okay. They wanted to go. But they didn't feel okay with saying, I want to go. Please let me go. They felt it was better for the family to say, I'm standing on these verses. So I mean, there's things that we don't understand. But if we could even come to grips with that, I think it'll change the way we face circumstances because if you haven't faced one yet, you will. It'll be one like, maybe you'll have a Jason story 
like mine that could potentially rock you. Which brings me to my point. We have people in our lives that are spiritually devastated because of a circumstance like that. This was almost 15 years ago. I could have gone shipwreck over that event. I almost did. I wanted to. I was furious. So there's people in our lives. When we begin to pray for these folks that we wrote down, maybe even that those persons or people groups have experienced something like that. One of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament, Elijah, faced a very similar situation. Just to bring it back to a biblical point of view, in, um, in 1 Kings 17, Elijah prophesies that there will be no rain until, until the word of the Lord comes. So for three years, absolute drought, no rain. Well, in 1 Kings 18, he's, uh, the Lord's beginning to bring direction back that he's going to, by the word of the prophet, he's going to deliver rain to the people. They haven't seen rain in three years, so he's going. And when Elijah comes, he calls for all of the false prophets of Baal, which was one of the false gods, and he brings them all out. And if you're not familiar with this story, I want to give some explanation, but if you are, just bear with me. He calls them all out, and he says, we're going to do this. We're going to build an altar over here by you, and then I'm going to build an altar over here. And what we're going to do is, is we'll put some wood on this altar, and we'll get it all prepared, but don't, don't set it on fire yet. Don't burn anything. What we're going to do is you're going to call on your God, and if your God shows up with fire and lights that, that altar on fire, then yours is the one and true God. He says, and I'll do the same, but I'm a gentleman, you go first. So he gives all these prophets of Baal the opportunity. I believe there's 450 of them. And they build this, and they're calling on him. And some time goes by, and it says it was just silence. So Elijah, which really makes me chuckle, he, he starts getting a little bit fun with them. He says, guys, maybe you should shout a little louder. Maybe he's sleeping. Maybe he doesn't hear you. Maybe he's out for a walk. So they begin to scream and yell. And then it says they go on, and they start cutting themselves piercing themselves through. So blood, literally, the scriptures say blood is gushing out of them because they're, they're, they're hoping that surely Baal will respond to this. Don't you see? I'm cutting myself to pieces. Still nothing. And so finally, it was Elijah's turn. And he, he says, not only are we going to do this, I want you to go dig a, a moat, if you will, a ring around this altar, and I want you to fill that up with water. And so they begin to fill it with water. And he says, mm, why don't you go ahead and dump some water on top of this too? So they go fetch water and they get it nice and wet. How about one more time? And how about a third time? And they put all this water on it, okay? And he begins to pray and he calls upon the name of the Lord. And it says that fire came down and the word that uh, the scripture says was licked. The fire licked the water right up and destroyed the altar. And all of the false prophets of Baal watched this happen and began to, to shout out, the Lord God of Elijah is the one and only true God. Elijah, without missing a beat, he takes his sword. He commands all of them to be brought together. He takes them down by the river, and he literally and physically slays them all with a sword. Can you imagine the bloody mess of destroying 450 people with a sword? So he, and how long that would take, for starters. <laughs> wow. He does it, wipes them out. Well, word gets back to the queen, and she says, by this time tomorrow, Elijah, you'll be just like my men. She's furious. He just basically killed off all of her prophets. And Elisha runs for his life. He says he goes and he hides underneath a, a juniper tree, and there he cries out and he begins to feel sorry for himself, and he says, God, take me now. Just kill me. I'm the only one left. I'm the only one that proclaims your name, Lord. He takes Elijah out of there, and he, I'll, I'll fast forward just a little bit. He puts him in the cleft of the rock, and he, he begins to demonstrate to him through the things of the elements, and then finally a still small voice, and he says, Elijah, not only are you not alone, but there's, there's 7,000 other prophets that haven't bowed their knee to the false god of Baal. You're not alone. And you know what, if you think about this, and this is where I want to use this analogy, what a powerful demonstration the man just saw. Fire from heaven comes and destroys this altar that's saturated in water, 
Okay, for one, he just killed 450 prophets with a sword. That's pretty burly. He's a man's man. I'm talking about, you know, cutting people up. At least a strong stomach guy. <laughs> and yet here he is just immediately after going, oh, God, there's one person who threatened my life. I'm running for my life. His perspective was wrong. That began the end of his ministry because he was then going to go uh, anoint Elisha for his replacement. Perspective can even devastate those who are the spiritually strongest among us. It depends on how you perceive it. There are those that are spiritually abused that within our church, I've shared this before, there's almost, almost perfectly in thirds within this, this particular community, there are a group of people that are hearing the gospel for the very first time. There are people that have once had an experience or were born again and got caught up in the things of the world, deceitfulness of the world, and got into the bondage of sin, and they're coming back, and, and you found a place here. The third group is those that have got caught up in uh, religion, abusive church authority, or things that got, got so bad that you, you just about gave up on God, but really were ready to give up on church. And yet we have this group of people all here in this community. At this conference that we were in, we were around some amazing teachers. Amazing teachers. And I thought the whole time, you know, as a pastor... I can't get away with teaching at a certain level. I can't assume, and, and I'm guilty of this, by the way. God's been dealing with me with this all week. I can't assume that everybody in the audience who's listening to me knows exactly the story of Elijah. Right. Nor can I assume that our Christianese words that we use, uh, like nobody's business, that everyone else in the room knows what that means. <laughs> you ever been out to one of those super spiritual Christians to a restaurant and they're using... There are Christianese with a waitress as if they, the waitress knows what the heck you're talking about. Then it sounds like you're being rude. You know what I mean? We use words that church culture we know. Rob and I were talking about the word worship. People that don't know church culture, when you start thinking worship, they don't know what worship means. So should we, could we at least be humble enough to use words and explain things that people could understand what the heck we're talking about? So they don't just come and have a religious experience, sing a few songs, hear a guy talk, and leave? But maybe, just maybe, we could explain it in such a way that the heart is impacted and they can apply that to their lives. But we have people that, because of spiritual abuse, they're analyzing every single word I say. And if you're bent or looking through certain glasses, you're hearing what I'm not saying. You might be thinking, I, I knew it. I knew he was one of those guys. He's in it for the money. I know it. He, he's just on a power trip. He's got a head bigger. He can't get through the door. I mean, put his face on a billboard, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and I joke about that, but I mean, if you're thinking that way, that's very, very insulting to some. And so I realize that. I've been where you're at. I've come through that. And so I, what I want to make the point here is that we're dealing with people who don't know they're broken. We have people that once had fellowship but because of a circumstance in life, they got disappointed and discouraged. And then you have those that, well, probably I fit into, if I'm honest. They came under a system that beat me up so bad that I didn't want to have anything to do with church culture. And yet I had to call a call of God on my life. There's people who've been under a dictator-type leadership. One of the common characteristics of abusive religious systems is the real needs of the people are, are lost in the never-ending quest for the leader's personal fulfillment and, ha and happiness. At your cost for my happiness. That's not even the kind of leadership Jesus said he was here for. Jesus said I, the Son of Man is not here to be served, but to serve. But to serve. Amen. Yes. So a real leader serves people. In speaking of the Pharisees, Jesus said, for the, the blind, uh, for they, they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and they lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves do nothing, not even lifting a finger to help them. Many of us have been under a system or have been talked to in such a way that you are burdened down so hard, so heavy, that getting through this, this Christian experience, it's, it's, it's daunting, and no one offers any assistance to help. 
How many have been in a church where you're the only one who shows up for a work party? <laughs> Quite a party. Maybe that's why when we throw out a volunteer system that some of you say, I'm going to go just because I know what it's like to be the only guy or girl to show up. Because I, I tell you here, I'm, I'm very much appreciative of the fact that we mention it and people come out of the woodwork to come serve. Yes. I don't take that for granted or take it lightly at all. I applaud you for that. Because I, Becky and I have been that, that, that couple that were the only ones who showed up. And you work around the clock. And it becomes not a thank you, but an expected. Right. And it hurts. It hurts. The Amplified Bible uh, paints an even clearer picture. It says, they tie up heavy loads, hard to bear, and place them on men's shoulders, but they themselves do not lift uh, a finger to help bear it uh, at all. Jesus, referring to people being uh, weighted down by rules and regulations that needed to be performed in order, again, to have acceptance by the Pharisees. Again, we, it's, a, it's a system that I put this burden on you, and you feel a pressure to do it so that you have the leadership's approval. And it becomes a, uh, a task, a religious obligation. And you know, there's nothing wrong with wanting to serve one another. There's a big difference between you being a blessing to me and me expecting you to serve me. Okay? And I mean that. Uh, I, I, I won't turn someone away who wants to be a blessing. Just like, don't turn me away if I can be a blessing to you. Amen? We're a family together. And so we'll take that outside of these four walls and we're going to love on people who are lost. We're going to love them. In the same way, many believers today have found themselves crushed beneath uh, religious baggage of abusive systems. Each day, thousands of church members find themselves struggling to earn the favor or approval with modern-day Pharisees. We have people that are in religious groups, traditional denominations, that it's all about getting the approval of the hierarchy within that denomination. I teach from Scripture the authority of the believer. And there actually, there's good balance on authority. But some of us have come from unbalanced authority. In an unhealthy church, the pastor actually begins to take the place of Jesus in the people's lives. Maybe you haven't been there, but I've been there. It's brutal. Commonly, people are told they can't leave a church without God's blessing unless the pastor approves the decision. The implication is that unless they receive the pastoral permission, not only will God not bless them, but they'll be cursed in some way, resulting in certain failure. I used to, I used to teach that. I'm embarrassed. So I know I can relate to this. We must understand the process the church goes through to reach the point of deception. This doesn't happen overnight. It's a process. And if you're deceived, you don't know you're deceived. Perfect analogy of this. Justin, would you stand for me? Justin is standing. But if he's deceived, he thinks he's sitting. Hey, Justin, you're standing. No, 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 Pastor, I'm, I'm sitting. <laughs> no, Justin, you're standing. But he's convinced that he's sitting. That's deception. When, when you have the right place of authority, when you respect someone's, uh, or value someone in your life enough that Justin, even though he believes with his whole heart, he's sitting. And I tell him, Justin, I'm telling you, brother, I love you. You're standing. He respects my, my love for him that even though he believes he's sitting, he'll go, all right, I trust him. I must be standing. Because if you're deceived, you don't know you're deceived. We need to have people in our lives. Thank you. We need to have people in our lives that can tell us that we're deceived. People that you can trust. That's, that's okay. That's balanced authority. Does that make sense to everybody? Finally, there's those that come from an elitist attitude. I've talked about this before. The deadly trait of elitism, uh, elitism produces an us and them mentality. A church with an elitist, elitist attitude believes no one else is really preaching the gospel except this church. Or at least no one's preaching it as effectively or as good as we are. The deadly trait of, of elitism, it produces the us and them mentality. A church with elitist attitude believes no one else uh, 
is doing it as, as well in their performance and that we've got something that they don't. We've got the corner market on it. And so we have to poke holes in everything that they're doing. I've said this before. I used to make fun of or poke holes in pastors like me. I would have to poke holes in churches like this because for Pete's sakes, people couldn't really be, your church couldn't grow like that without doing something milk toast. Or they must be only given part of the, the, the truth because, man, we've had five people in this Bible study for 10 years and, and we, we got it all right. <laughs> you know what I mean? The lead of spirit discourages church members from visiting other churches or receiving counsel from anyone who doesn't attend their church. If anyone visits another church, he's viewed as a rebel. I was told, do not read any other book by an author from someone that's outside of our camp. Because it's just going to sow confusion. No, no, that's control. That's manipulation. Now, do I read a lot of books? And I read a lot of different authors. Do I agree with every single, every single thing that I read in their books? No. But you know what? There's a lot of principles. There's a lot of nuggets and the different things that people uh, that, are, that they're experiencing that you can receive from. The old adage, shoo up the meat, spit out the fat. Keep what's good. Apply it. Let it bless your life. But that's why we have the Holy Spirit. That helps lead us. That's why we are students of our Bibles. If you have a question about something, come find church leadership. Say, you know what? This sounds a little bit different. Is this accurate? And you know what? I'm, I'm encouraged by the fact that people in this church do do that. Yes. This seems a little bit odd. Doesn't sound just right. Is this accurate with Scripture? I welcome that. I'm so grateful for that kind of climate or atmosphere within this church. May we never lose that. So let me wrap up with this. How then should we be praying for the lost? I'm convinced that most of us have prayed something like this, and it's absolutely a slap in the face of Jesus. Many of us, including myself, have prayed something to the effect of, Lord, please save my lost neighbor. Lord, if you love my neighbor as much as I did, or I do, certainly you would save him. Lord, save my coworker. Why would that? That sounds good, right? I mean, you're asking God to save them. I mean, on the surface, what's wrong with that prayer? Because Jesus has done all the saving he'll ever do. That's right. You didn't get saved from your sin the day that you accepted it. The price was paid 2,000 years ago. Right. You now received it at the moment that you got born again. The price was paid. He saved. He paid the price to save everyone 2,000 years ago. Your neighbor, your lost loved one, your family member, your friend, to pray something to the effect, Jesus, save them, is saying that what Jesus did wasn't enough. How about you go over and tell your neighbor that the price was paid? How about you, if you have that access? Now, there are those of us that you, you, um, you don't have that kind of access. There are people in my life, there are family members in my, in my life, that because of certain circumstances, they won't receive from me. But there's others. There's others that can, can, uh, can go across their paths, others that can come to them and share the goodness of God. He can use other methods. So first off, we should be thanking God that he does love the lost. We thank God for the, excuse me, for the price that was paid for us all. And we begin to use our God-given authority we pray or speak to the fact that their eyes are blinded and command their eyes to be opened. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. Whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the, eye, let, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. So we can begin to pray for that person. I command that the, the blindness be, renew, be removed and that in Jesus' name, the, the light of the gospel comes across them. We can pray for uh, people to cross their paths. Matthew chapter 9, verse 38. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest field. Now the reason I wanted to clarify on that is because if you are available, if you do have access, you should go. You should share. Yeah, but I don't have it all figured out. I don't know the Romans road. I don't know all the right verses to say. I'm not sure how, what would I say to them? 
Great analogy that helped me with this. If you are a witness to a murder and the lawyers call you up and say, Carol, I know that you witnessed this murder happen. I'm going to call you on the stand. What are we going to ask her to do? She's going to testify as to what she's seen. That is what being uh, testifying or giving a testimony is all about. If all I know is that once I was lost and now I'm found, I'm alive today. There's a difference in me. I, I was dead before and I, I've now received life. If that's all you know, then share it. Then share it. That's your testimony. You don't have to go any further and you don't have to embellish. You just tell the truth and nothing but the truth. As far as you know it. As you grow in understanding, you can, you can add more to that. More revelation, more understanding, more confidence. The more that you experience, you can share with people. But you know what the loudest testimony that you and I have? It's how we talk, we live, and react. That is, that'll, that'll speak much, much louder than your words. I worked in an environment, uh, very much more intelligent people than me. And, and I know it insulted people that I was promoted to the position I, I was because I wasn't one of the smart kids. You know, I didn't fit that mold. And across the hallway from me was a coworker that was, he's one of the most intelligent people I've ever met. And he tried to, to beat me up on my faith with intelligence and reason. And we would go on trips together. We traveled a lot for company purposes. And uh, I remember on one trip, we were, we were, just, we were here in the, in the States. We were driving to this particular one, and the conversation got going about the things of God. And um, I'll tell you, if you've ever had one of these ones where someone's just like shotgunning question after question, or what about this, or how do you respond to this, you get done, man. It feels like you ran a marathon. I couldn't wait to get out of that car. I'm like, oh, Jesus, rescue me now. At the same time, I couldn't help but think, these are great questions. This person has really given a lot of thought to these particular things, even has partially studied these things out. How can I fault the person for asking me questions? I'm a question asker still to this day. If I don't understand, I want to find someone who can help me understand. Months later, we're on another trip, this time much further. We're heading across the ocean. We touch down and we get dinner that night. The first thing he says to you is, you remember when we drove to Cleveland? <laughs> Couldn't forget it. He goes, do you know you're the first person that's ever had a conversation with me, and he used the word religion, about religion, and didn't get mad. He didn't get defensive. And you just talked with me. I said, and in my, in my mind, I'm, I'm having celebrations. I'm like, thank you, Jesus, you know. Thank God I didn't. But he goes, I've never had that. I've, I've never had that without someone getting upset and offended with me. And I wanted to thank you for that. Because up until that point, months had gone by, he never mentioned it. I wasn't sure how that affected him. I say that to encourage you. Most people are not mature enough to go out of their way to say, you know what, Cassie, what you said to me the other day, last week, that impacted my life. That's right. They can't frame those questions, so true. but they're thinking it. Yep. And because they don't share it, you start thinking, am I even making a difference around here? There, it's funny. Even pastoring, as I teach on a Sunday, there's, we've, I've got a few that I can always count on do dozing off. And, uh, or I've got a few people <laughs> that uh, they, they, you think you're being uh, savvy, but <laughs> one of these. Or... Uh, or I look across the audience and, and there's just, you know, kind of a poker face. It, and if I judge by what I'm seeing by your faces every week, uh, and that's not every time. I mean, y'all are smiling at me now because you feel obligated, but I appreciate it. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> but, you know, if I look across the audience and there's, you know, stone faces, I could, I could begin to get discouraged and think, man, Lord, I, are they getting this? Or uh, am I communicating this well? Or... I could swear you spoke this to my heart to share this. And then a, the following day or weeks ahead, someone will quote something that we taught on. Or they're doing it now. They're, they've, they've made that adjustment, and they'll come and say, hey, we're seeing this in our lives. And I thought, man, you were the one that was giving me this <laughs> face, you know. And they're getting it. So I say that because just because someone doesn't go out of their way to tell you, hey, you're really making a difference in my life. You are. You are. So he shares this with me, Turns, comes to find out, and, and some people you'll learn, you go as far as they'll let you. 
So because he opened up the door, I went as far as he would let me. I found out that he had given his life to Christ in college and got offended by something. Something hurt him. Somebody hurt him. And he was hardened by that. And so he, I, I complimented him. I said, listen, the fact that you're asking questions is good because if you keep asking the questions, you're going to find Jesus in the end. Well, as soon as, that was about as far as we could go that time. We made another trip. This was a whirlwind trip. We actually came from the UK back to the States, slept in our own beds one night, and then jumped a plane to California. So we were in like three time zones in about four days. We get out there. Sparks up another conversation about the things of God at his pace. This time at the end of the conversation, this hardened, almost mean, literally made a person cry in an interview once. Just trying to paint a picture. I'll have to make sure he never hears this recording because he'll know who I'm talking about. <laughs> At the end of that conversation, he walks over and embraces me and gives me a hug. And at first, I thought he was just teasing with me. No. No, God was melting these things off his life. Fast forward a few more months or even a year. We're on another trip together. And um, maybe some of you that have traveled or have been around purchasing equipment. One of the things that the world loves to do is they think it's cool to wine and dine people if you're spending money with them. I, I'm not at all interested in that. Just I, I don't care that we spend $100 on my, my plate, and I certainly don't want to sit here and get drunk with you. So it's not my interest. I, I'm more interested. Just drop me off at the hotel. I'm good with that. You know, let me, you, if you always want to go out and have, do what you want to do, do what you're going to do. I'm not interested. For this particular time, I had no, I, they just were going, and I, here, I, here we are miles away from my hotel. Unless I was going to hoof it back to my hotel, I went and had dinner. Well, they began to, we were there longer and longer and longer. One of the sales reps, after his, his, uh, the guard was down, he's like, so why aren't you drinking? And I said, you know, I, I just, I don't drink. And immediately, without missing a beat, is that a religious thing? You're not allowed to do that? So, I, you can do what you want, but when you're, when you're talking spiritual things with, with someone who's drunk, my experience tells me it doesn't go very far. So I'm not in a hurry to jump into this conversation. I, I kind of closed the door because it, it wasn't going to be very fruitful, but he kept going at it. And then he starts running his mouth about different things, and then he started getting personal and insulting about things. The whole time, this particular coworker that I t I've been telling you about was with me. And he's sitting here, and, and out of nowhere, he puts his fist down on the table, and he's a big man. He pounds that table down, and he, he gets right up in front of these guys. I've had enough. You don't know the first thing about this man. And I, I lean back, and I'm like, what in the world? He bowed up. He's like, I'll tell you this. If there's anyone who's authentic about Christianity, it's this man. And if my wife and I, we ever decide to go to, back to church, we're going to his church. So until you know him better than me, you better shut your mouth. And these guys are like, <laughs> he, said, he sits back down, looks at me, and uh, does one of these. And I'm like, well done. The next morning, my phone was blown up by these guys. They were apologizing to me, my, my coworker was the same way. He's like, man, I'm really sorry that we put you in that predicament. I say that because the way you live, the way you talk, the way you respond, they're not going to go out of their way to tell you you're making a difference. But they are desperate for you to be authentic. They're desperate. They'll even be mean. They'll poke you like poking a bear. They're, but they really don't want you to respond. But they're expecting you to respond like every other religious person that they've come across. What you're saying and doing is your biggest testimony. And when finally they recognize there's something very different about you, you're different, you're not like the other ones, and they'll open their heart, and they're ready to receive. And sometimes you can go the whole distance. Other times you're the seed planter, or you're the seed waterer. But God is the one who brings the increase. Oh, that's good. Romans 10, 14 says, How then shall... They call on him in whom they've not believed. And how shall they believe in him whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Yes, people get born again and saved in a church setting. But we are all called, according to 2 Corinthians 5, I believe it's verse 19, to the ministry of reconciliation. 
When you got born again, you became a full-time minister. Welcome to the club. You became a full-time minister. You just get to shine your light everywhere you go. Pray that they will hear the word of God. 1 Peter 1.23 says, Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Finally, Romans 10.17 10, says, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. We just need to pray that any avenue possible, that there will be a laborer that will come across their path. Any way possible that the word of God will get planted in their heart that will produce the faith needed to receive. There's so many various backgrounds that are represented here that I don't even, I purposely have not tried to figure out names on any of these that you've written down. And I know, I just know by the Spirit of God that they represent so many different people. You've got people that fit in one of those categories, I'm sure of it, across this, across this congregation. When Jesus would walk into a village, I believe it's 32 different times, not say village, but any, any community, I believe it's 32 different times that we see the, the phrase, and Jesus had compassion on them all and healed their sick. You know, we, we heard this weekend at this conference that sometimes we, we try to clean the fish before we catch them. You know, we need, to, we need to have compassion on them because they already are lovable. Paul says it this way. Would you stand with me? Paul says it this way in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. That God demonstrated his love toward us while we were yet sinners. You were already loved by God in your worst state. The people that you know that have not made a decision for Christ or those who are wandering, they're lost and they're, they're frustrated. They've had a, a circumstance that they perceived to put God in a bad image. Or we've done an injustice to them as, as church leaders and we've abused them, we've hurt them through religious traditions and, and spiritual abuse. I pray right now, Lord Jesus, for each one of us. We pray that this message has touched your heart and has brought encouragement to your life. That Believer's Christian Church, we're a vibrant, growing body of believers hungry for an authentic walk with our Savior. We want to encourage you to join us this Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Visit us on the web at believerschristianchurch.com.